morning, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few comments, which is not my custom, but I will make them at this time since uh, it needs to be made. I don't want you to feel like I'm rushing off. This is going to be my last message for the camp meeting, unfortunately, because as you've been hearing from the various prayers that have been kind of circular, uh, my wife is in labor right now, and as she's under a bit of affliction, uh, getting ready to deliver a little baby, uh, I've been talking with her, and uh, we've talked about this possibility, but she recognizes that I've been set apart to preach the gospel. And she not only wanted to come, but she encouraged me to go and, as the Bible says, stand in the temple and preach all the words of this life. Uh, because of her zeal, she's alone now, but God is with her. Um, I don't plan to cut short this message, uh, nor do I plan to weary you with too many words, but don't think that my zeal or the forcefulness of presentation means I'm trying to hurry up. I, I'm excited about God's word. Um, I'd just like to say something I thought was interesting also is that as I went out, as I've been going back and forth and was talking with her, checking in on her how she's doing and seeing how she is, uh, I was letting her know that I'm going to be leaving soon. I'm just going to do a message and I'll be getting on my way, going down to the airport and coming back home and uh, put everything in God's hands. And then as I came back out to come back in, they started singing the song, Hold Fast Till I Come. Yeah. <laughs> Some people got that. Hold fast till I come. God is faithful. God is faithful. I'd like this morning to, to give a a message that is going to be, I believe, a rich blessing to those that are Bible students. If you haven't really studied the Bible um, very broadly and deeply, I believe still the Spirit of God is going to give a blessing to you because I've asked God to put me aside and to give a message that's going to help God's people to awake to who they are, where they are, and what they should do. So we want to ask God to do a special work, uh, not because it's my last session here, and I must rush off to Boston, but uh, because the time for us to solidify our relationship with God is coming to an end. Uh, just as my wife is laboring to bring forth a son, a daughter, the prophecies say that the prophetic signs are like the labor pains of a woman. As we see the frequency and the intensity of these signs, we know that it's just about time for the Lord to come. I'd like to preach a message called Awakening Zion. Awakening Zion, which will deal with the topic of justification and sanctification in the context of God's church triumphing at the end. To deal with that, we must deal with the topic, as we've been looking at in this idea of justification and sanctification, of the work of the Spirit in the life, bringing the power of God and leading us to perfection, which we know as Seventh-day Adventists is seen in the work of the early and latter rain. The early and latter rain. And just as justification and sanctification is not preached much, or is preached in an erroneous bent, or is not understood, so also the idea of the early and latter rain is not clearly understood among us. Many people have a lot of ideas about it, but there are many people that have theories and you, they'll say, well, the latter rain is this. But they really can't show you from the Bible what the latter rain, the early rain, is, or how it's going to come, or what must happen for this to come. We like to deal with this as we show parallel prophecy through the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy. Let's have a word of prayer. Just bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer one more time. Heavenly Father, nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to thy cross I cling. Lord, I renounce myself and everything that I have ever done, both in your name or personally. I come as an empty vessel, designed that you would use me in your service this morning, that you would put self aside. Lord, I surrender my heart and my voice and my words and my mind that it may be used by Thee 
for the purpose of awakening Zion this morning. Through the instrumentality of this videotape or audio cassette recording and all that might be done with it, I pray that you would cause revival and reformation wherever these words are heard and that you would do this work that's prophesied in this message for we ask all these blessings, even the forgiveness of sins, as we open your word, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're turning in our Bibles, if you would permit me, grace to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah, the 10th chapter. Zechariah, chapter 10 in the Old Testament. I hope everyone has their Bible. One amen. amen. Zechariah, chapter 10. Zechariah chapter 10. We want to understand how Zion, which seems to be so ready to fall, so full of abominations, which we're sighing and crying about, how is Zion going to be awakened? It seems as if, as the parable that Christ gives states, that all are slumbering and asleep. How shall we wake up Zion? There is a message to wake up Zion. There is a work to wake up Zion. But many people are unfamiliar with it. And even those that have trimmed their lamps and gone out to meet the bridegroom have fallen asleep with the very purpose and principles and power to awaken Zion. So we turn to the book of Zechariah chapter 10 to ask ourselves this question. Zechariah 10 and verse 1. Say amen if you have it. In Zechariah 10 and verse 1, the Bible says, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Now looking at this first verse that we've started with our, our, our springboard text, we see that the Bible God is using symbolism. He's using imagery because it says clearly that we're to ask of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain and brothers and sisters we are in greater need of spiritual blessings than temporal rain. Amen. We don't need physical rain the way we need spiritual blessings in this time of deep darkness in the church and out of the church. And these symbols of rain and bright clouds and showers and grass are symbols of something that we must decode from the Word of God. But we want to focus on this chapter and focus on what is this early and latter rain? What is this rain, this, this symbolic rain that's going to be poured out for the people of God at a specific time that they're to ask for it? And what's that time? Because the Bible says, ask of the Lord rain in the... There's a time not only for the latter rain, but it's a time for the asking and receiving of the latter rain. And the one great problem is that we as a people have become wholly and almost entirely ignorant of the fact that there is such thing as this early and latter rain in its true verity and also that there's a time to ask for it that we may receive and God may give, as the Bible says, showers of rain. Showers of rain. This topic or this idea of the early and latter rain or this endowment of rain as a symbol is not unique to this passage in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, it's found all throughout the scriptures. And when we look at the story uh, or the book that Moses wrote called Deuteronomy, we find that Moses spoke about and even gave an understanding of what this rain is. The book of Deuteronomy means, or the word Deuteronomy means repeating of the law. In other words, you see in Exodus and Numbers and so on, the law is given and it's very, very clear what the law says. It says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. It says, this is going to happen. You must cut off this and you must do this and you must remove this and you must slay this person. It is very, 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 very clear. And it seems to many minds, even today, that it seems to be all law and no grace. But there's grace there in these chapters. But in the book of Deuteronomy, where the law is repeated, God now comes and repeats the history of Israel and the teachings, but there is an element here that sometimes is lost sight of in the other books. As a matter of fact, when we look at the Old Testament, does Moses' writings deal with circumcision? Does it deal with circumcision? What does circumcision mean? Is it just some type of way, or as some people say today, in our, in our modern world, quote-unquote, it's, it's genital mutilation. <laughs> now, we're not going to get into all the different ramifications of that, but... There is a symbolic purpose for circumcision, which is not seen in the original command to the casual reader or those not illuminated by the Spirit. So in Deuteronomy, 
we have Moses coming back and Moses says, circumcise your heart. He gives the true interpretation of what this cutting away of the flesh meant so that God's purpose could be fulfilled. Deuteronomy does this all the way through. And in the book of Deuteronomy, we're turning there now, Deuteronomy 30, 31 I believe it is, Deuteronomy 31, notice how under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Moses gives an understanding of what this reign is of which we need early and latter power. The first reign, as in the agricultural cycle of almost any agricultural person or place or town, you need the early rain and the latter rain, the former rain and the later season rain to ripen the harvest. Look what it says in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, 32, pardon me, 32, notice Moses explaining under the inspiration of God what this rain means. In Deuteronomy 32 and verse 1, notice what it says here. Say amen if you have that. Here is a primary understanding we must receive because as we go further in our message, God's going to expand our understanding of what this reign is by showing how he's going to fulfill it. Look what it says here in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 1. It says, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will what? Speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. He's giving a message. Amen? Amen. He is speaking or declaring some truth. It says, verse 2, My what? Doctrine shall drop as the, what's this rain? It is doctrine, it is a message, it is the words of God that have its purpose to drop somewhere, and even to drop in the earth. Now, brothers and sisters, doesn't the book of Luke chapter 8 and verse 11 say the seed is the word of God? Remember the parable of Christ, the seed is the word of God? And these various parables are showing that the seed was planted in the in the what? Starts with the E. What is the earth? The heart. So when we talk about this word or this message or this doctrine, all throughout the book of Deuteronomy and Numbers and so on, God is trying to get the people of God not to just have tables of stone written before them or something in an ark or a testament behind curtains. The law was to be written, the message was to be received in their heart. It was to be heart religion. There was to be a new heart. So when we look at Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 1, 2 and on, it says, Give ear ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, or hear hearts, hard-hearted people of God, hear the words of God, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill. What's distilled water? It has no elements in it. It has no earthliness. All that Adam was made from, all that humanity is made from, is not in this message. This message is a pure message. It has no earthliness. It, it, it's a divine message of a divine origin. The water that goes up into the clouds is distilled water. The sun, the light hits it, and it divests us of all impurities and all earthliness that it may go up and travel to where God would have it to be and to fall into the earth or into the heart as it should be. That is the spiritual parallel that we're looking at. Are we were together? So it says, my doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, early rain, and the showers, latter rain, upon the grass. Can you see it? The early and latter rain has to deal with not just, and we might say, if I asked you the question, you say the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and we're going to see that truly in a moment, but let us not think that we're going to receive the Spirit of God without the Word of God. That we're going to see the Spirit of God as the Word has outlined for us to speak. Because some people say, I have the Spirit. I can sing with the Spirit. Boom. Oh, dance with the Spirit. And they start to go to town up inside here, dancing and shuffling. I have the Spirit. Start barking, meowing, laughing. I have the Spirit, and they start speaking and babbling in all these various so-called tongues. But the Word of God and a message is going to bring on this endowment of rain. There's a certain message that here in Deuteronomy 32, Moses prophesied. He saw it afar off because it was an everlasting gospel that Moses was preaching then, and it was going to go brighter and grow brighter even unto the perfect day. Moses looked down the stream of time and he said, hey, my doctrine, my, my message shall do this work 
even as the early rain and latter rain. Are we still together? Do we want to hear some more? This is the word of God, brothers and sisters. This is how God has given us our understanding of divine truth. So we understand that a certain message is going to bring about this early and latter rain. Amen. Now let's go to another text that, again, I would call a parallel scripture or parallel prophecy found in the book of Joel 2. Joel 2. Because in Joel 2, we're going to see that Joel 2 and the message and work and even the spiritual emphasis of Joel 2 is trying to bring the people of God to understand this work of the early and latter rain. The what? The early and latter rain. We're going to Joel 2. Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And our brother had a little trouble there. You know, Joel. People, you, know, you say Joel, the people say Job or you have to say Joel. It's Joel, but people don't usually hear it very well. So we're going to the book of Joel. Joel. Joel chapter 2. Let's see if in Joel chapter 2, God is dealing with, in this chapter, the early and latter rain. And if we find that, then we know we're in the right place, and we can understand something in here of how this work is going to be done. And even I would suggest to you, or I would submit to you, that we can find out what the time of the latter rain is, that we may ask in that time and receive these blessings that were seen all the way in the Old Testament that stretch all the way to the end of time. In Joel 2 it says this, beginning in verse 23. Joel 2 and verse 23. Say amen if you have it. Amen. Joel 2 and verse 23, the Bible says very, very clearly, Be glad then, ye children of... Now we know who this them are that's in this grass and receive this outpouring. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the what? The former rain, what? Moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain, when? In the first month. What first month? And it says here in this prophecy that God will do this. So in other words, when we see where this text is in Joel 2, it's saying that possibly what came before this text brought the people to receive this early rain, to see the time of the latter rain, to see this time and to ask for it, to be in harmony with it so they can receive this early rain and latter rain. You say, are you sure? Well, look at it again. Look at it one more time. In verse 23, it says, be glad. What's the next word? Oh, you missed it. Be glad what? Then. Let me change it for a minute, just for sake of understanding. Be glad now. Amen. Be glad yesterday. Be glad what? Then. Then is a what? Definite point in time. In other words, the message and the work that comes before, in Joel chapter 2, verse 1, all the way down to verse 22 and so on, is giving an outline of what is necessary for us to be not only discerning the times, but also in harmony with God so that we can be glad then. Why? Because, what? He hath given you the former rain. Someone must have asked. Someone must have heard the message, received it, and receive this early rain, and they're looking forward. Look what it says, looking forward, and he will cause, meaning future, right? Yes. This early rain and abiding in it will cause future tense him to do what? He has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause future tense to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the in its time. Do you see that? You don't see that. That's what Joel 2 is saying. Joel 2 is saying this to us. Amen? It's showing this to us. And when we talk about this work of the early and latter rain and how this early and latter rain is going to be poured out upon us, the Bible gives us even more understanding of how this work is going to be done because it goes on. It goes on. Look at Joel chapter 2 and drop your eyes down to verse 28, because as a result of this early and latter rain being poured out upon the people of God, then the Bible clearly is going to give us an understanding of how it will be manifested. The message, receiving the message, manifestation. Look at the manifestation, verse 28. 
and it shall come to pass. What does that mean? That means when this outpouring takes place, there will be some manifestation that will be visible. That we will know either whether we're on the side of God or against God, that this is the time of the latter rain. It's happening all around us. Now, we may think it's fanaticism, but it's happening. So it says here in Joel chapter 2 and verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward, or that definite time when this thing happens and this, all this work is coming to pass, it shall happen or it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon. In other words, without the right message, there's going to be no spirit. It shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. But remember, he qualified it already because he already said all flesh that had the early and they're looking for the latter rain. All flesh that were glad then because they received the message of Joel 1 all the way down. They were prepared flesh, prepared vessels. That all is going to receive the power of the latter and early rain. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your uh -oh, women's ordination. No. Because God has always poured his spirit upon man. Do you think that Eve didn't have the spirit? But Eve was a wife, wasn't she? Men and women always have the spirit of God. Didn't Philip have daughters that were prophetess? Yes. But they were not elders. Right? Who was the first to go and announce Christ risen from the grave? Mary. She said, the Lord is risen indeed. But strangely enough, when they wanted to ordain one, they said, hey, there's one. we need someone that's been with us in the John the Baptist. We need one more in this upper room. To, did they say, hey, Mary. I'm going to leave that alone because we don't have time to deal with that. We don't have time to deal with that. We don't have time to deal with things that are not in the Bible. We're dealing with what's in the Bible. In Joel 2, it says this. It says, I will pour my spirit upon sons and daughters, and they shall, they shall give the word with power. I've seen young girls. I've seen teenage girls come to the school of the prophets, and it's not about the school of the prophets, it's about the curriculum we have. We have the Bible, we have the spirit of prophecy, and we give young people time to pray and study these books, and they start preaching with such power. Do you know that I had a young girl about 19, 17, 18, 19 years old make me weep? You know when the last time a seventh-day Adventist minister has made me weep, cry? I wasn't the only one. The whole congregation, you, you could not hear uh, there was not a dry, you heard loud weeping in the congregation. A teenager, a woman, a girl. Spirit of God. Because the Bible says if they have the right message, God will attend it with his spirit if they ask in the right time. And God says sons and daughters will receive this gift. It will be a witness in all the world and then shall the end come. And where is the end coming now? Because the message has been lost. No message, no spirit. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. They will understand both there's going to be inspiration, as we know with Ellen White, but also there's going to be people that are going to be able to see these visions carefully, connectedly. They'll see John standing in his lot, Daniel standing in his lot. They'll be able to put them together and prophesy them with great power. Great power in all parts of the world. Young men, women, old men, they're able to see the message clearly. And the Bible says, verse 29, also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. Amen. Now, here is where it gets interesting for those that study the Bible. We understand <clears throat> that this, as we study text by text, has a certain time. Amen? Amen? I want you to see that the Apostle Peter understood when the time had come, but I want you to know, if you're a careful Bible student, that what Peter understood as the time was what you call a partial fulfillment. A partial fulfillment. And I'm going to show you that from the Word of God, very simply, not because it's my Great intellect, but it's just comparing scripture with scripture, okay? We just find in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, that this 
time of the latter rain, God's going to pour out his spirit. And God says, afterward, I will do it. Okay? Notice what it says in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Hold your finger in Joel 2. Hold your Bible marker in Joel 2, because we're coming right back, looking at these various texts. Hold your Bible marker in Joel 2, and we're going to the book of Acts 2 now. Acts chapter 2. I told you I'm not, taking, I'm not rushing. I'm taking my time, but I'm going to preach in a little bit. Joel chapter 2. Now we're going to Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2, I want you to know that the same thing that we call the Pentecostal power, or the outpouring of Pentecost, was the early rain. How do you get that? What? Oh, here we go. Here we go with some kind of... Wait, now, how did he get that? Let's see if you'll get it too. In Acts chapter 2, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was what? That's a definite point in time, right? A time had come. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. Hmm. I wonder if that was necessary. Doctrinally and spiritually. It says... And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a, a, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon all of them, or each of them. And they were, now each of them was also like all flesh, but let's go on. Verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other dialects, other languages, as the Spirit gave them what happened to them? They were in the upper room, all on one accord, all in one place. And the Spirit of God at a definite period of time came upon all of them. And they received the Spirit of God fully into their lives. And they gave a manifest evidence in spiritual gifts. Of which tongues was the most prominent because they had to preach in these tongues. There were other gifts like evangelists and prophets and so on. All these things were given as, as Christ ascended on high. He gave gifts unto men. But the most prominent detail in this chapter, this passage, is the act of gifts or the, the gift of tongues or languages because they had to preach to various proselytes from other different nations. They had to go to all the world. Sound familiar to me? In Acts chapter 2, notice how Peter explains what this manifest, manifestation was. And what this time was, and what was taking place, as we call it Pentecost, look at what Peter called this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, it says this. Look at verse 14. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Acts 2 and verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, my gospel, my message, like Moses had, because... These are not drunken. These have not been going to the first day church. These have not been bringing Catholicism into the church. These have not had false theories and principles. They have a pure message. These are not drunken with the wine of Babylon, as ye suppose. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet. Oh. Oh, this is a proof text. This is what was speaking of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass... Afterward, on the inspiration, he said, in the last days. Amen. Definite point in time. In the last days, he says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Now, what? Sons and daughters, if you go back to Acts chapter 1, we have some time, don't we? Yes. My wife's okay. Trust me. Trust me. Look what it says in Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, it says, this spirit will be poured upon all flesh, sons and daughters. And people say, wait a minute, wait a minute. It was just the twelve, they, just them that received the spirit of God. Watch it. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And verse 13. Notice who were in the upper room on one accord in one place. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 13 it says, And they were come, as they were come in, they went into an upper room where they abode Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthias, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, Amen. and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren, younger people. Amen. Women were in the upper room. Mary was in the upper room. They all received this outpouring of the Spirit, but God chose some elders to preach the message that day. I'm not going back there. I'm not going back. Don't make me go back there. I'm, go I'm going forward. I'm going forward, Pastor. I'm going forward. Okay? We're going to the book of Acts chapter 2, and we're continuing this thought because this was a fulfillment of the prophecy to the letter. 
It was the fulfillment of Joel 2. But I want you to see that it was a partial fulfillment by which we're going to understand that this was not the time for us because it's already, if this is the time for us, then we're all lost. Amen. The time has already passed. It was a time, as Peter says here, in the last days. Because notice what it says in Acts 2. Let's go on. Acts 2. Let's drop down to verse 18. And upon my servants and on the handmaidens, I will pour in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Verse 19. And I will show wonders in a sign. And what? Signs of the earth beneath. Blood. Fire. What? Vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord shall come and shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, whosoever shall ask of rain in the time of the latter rain. You say, what? That's not the same thing. Didn't Moses say? Hold your finger there. Hold your finger there. You're not following me. Hold your finger in Acts 2. Notice what Moses said. You're not listening to what I'm talking about here. The Spirit of God is trying to talk to you. In the book of Deuteronomy, look at what Moses said. It says, those that call upon the name of the Lord at this time shall be saved. It's the same thing as asking of rain in the time of the rather rain. How do you get that? In Deuteronomy 32, notice what the rain was. In Deuteronomy 32, notice that the rain is not only a message, but it proclaims the name of the Lord. So calling for this latter rain is also calling for the name or character of God to reign into my heart, giving justification and sanctification in an end time message. We're looking at the book of Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 1 for a proof text. If you have that, say amen. In Deuteronomy 32 and verse 1 it says, Give ye, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness to our God. Did you get that? So when you're asking for rain in a time of the latter rain, you're asking for the name of of the Lord. And we found our previous message that the name of the Lord is his character. Where? To fall on the earth or into my heart. Now I may reflect it down here and that the earth may be filled with the glory of God. We found the book of Acts chapter 2. As we continue, we're together, aren't we? Are we together? Walking with the Spirit now. We found in Acts chapter 2 that this same prophecy we saw in Joel we see here in the book of Acts chapter 2. It's a proof text of this being the same endowment. What we call Pentecost is also the outpouring of this early and latter rain power. But also, when we talk about the time of the latter rain, the prophet here in Acts chapter 2, quoting Acts, sorry, Joel 2, we didn't read all Joel 2, quoting Joel 2 includes some key prophetic events by which we'll discern what time in the last days is the time for the outpouring of the early and latter rain that we who are watching and tearing and occupying till he comes will be able to see these signs and we're able to look up and lift up our heads asking for this rain, open our mouth wide that God may... You know the text I'm going to, you know the text. There are some signs. There's going to be fire, there's going to be smoke, there's going to be blood, there's going to be stars, there's going to be all these things in the sun, the moon, the star is going to happen as a sign that we're in the time of the latter rain and God's going to give a message that we may be able to ask of the Lord and receive of the Lord through receiving this message, the power to finish the work. Amen. Let's go back to Joel 2. You have Joel 2? I hope you put your Bible marker there. We're going to the book of Joel 2, and let's see in Joel 2, it's the same thing. Joel 2 says this. Let's see it. What Peter quoted is right here in Joel 2, Joel 2 and verse 30. Let's see that what Peter says here is right exactly what's in Joel 2. In Joel 2 and verse 30, it says this. Joel 2, let's look at verse 29 for contextual purposes. In Joel 2 and verse 29, it says, And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days I will pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke the sun shall be turned into 
and the moon into before the great and terrible, not notable, but terrible day of the Lord. Meaning not the first coming, but the... That alone should tell you that this is not dealing with the first coming where the Peters and the apostles were preaching. It's dealing with the last day. Not as he come as a babe, but as a conquering king with flaming fire. The terrible and noble day of the Lord is the last days. And around that time, God's going to pour out his spirit and ripen the harvest for the end. And when we look at this, there's some signs that God gives. As a matter of fact, look at Joel 2 again. In Joel 2, if you go back, because we're going to look at this chapter very carefully. And look at Joel 2. Joel 2. And turn your eyes down to verse, verse 9. Joel 2. And, well, look at verse 10. Joel 2 and verse 10. Because remember I said that the previous text, verses, Joel, Joel 2 verses 1 all the way to 20 something so on, that said various things, gave various commands, are preparing a people to receive that early and latter rain. That's what it says, be glad therefore. Based upon what I said before, be glad. Receive this early and latter rain. Look what it says in Joel 2 and verse 10. Giving again in this chapter signs and evidences so we can know the time of the latter rain. Verse 10 of Joel 2, say amen if you have it. The earth shall quake before them. What? Earthquake. The heaven shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw his shine, or their shining, and the Lord shall... When these things, when the sun and the moon and the stars are affected, and when the earth quakes, God will do what? God will give this message. The name of the Lord is going to be declared. It's time to ask of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. Amen? But what is this time that takes place in the last days? Let's look at a parallel prophecy because when we look at the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of prophecy puts the book of Joel 2 and Acts 2 right together with the book of Revelation chapter 6. Notice that. In Revelation 6 it says this. Revelation 6. We're looking for the last book of the Bible. The book of Revelation, the sixth chapter. And let's see if in Revelation chapter 6 we are to understand that the same signs seen in Joel and Acts are taking place here in Revelation showing the same truth, the same event, the same body of people being gathered together to do a final work. Amen. Revelation 6 says this. Revelation 6 chapter, beginning with verse 12. Brothers and sisters, if you're an Adventist, Amen. if you're a part of God's true people, then all these parallel prophecies, you, you know all this, don't you? But now we're putting it all together. We're applying parallel at the parallel at the parallel. You ever seen a kaleidoscope? What's a kaleidoscope? It's like a little tunnel or a little thing. You, you look at it and it has various different filters. And if you turn it, you get different views. But, but the, the power of this, this view is based upon the fact that filters behind filter. If you just took one, it would just be green. If you took one, it would just be yellow. If you took one, it would just be white. Or one would be black. But you put them all together and you see all this. You see a more richer color. But when you take Daniel 2 and Daniel 8 and Daniel 7 and all these problems, and you put them line upon line upon line upon line, and you look at them now, you can see the face of God. You see the approaching God come. You can see where you are in Bible prophecy and what must be given to give a people a message to wake up Zion. I hope we're together in Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation 6 and beginning in verse 12, notice what it says happens under the sixth seal. In other words, the sixth seal is a parallel of Joel 2. Look what it says in the book of Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. In Revelation 6 and verse 12 it says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great, what? Have mercy. Are the prophets seeing the same thing? The Bible says even old men will see visions. I got some gray hair up here. I'm looking at it. Are you looking at this? Hmm. I beheld, and he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as... When did the sixth seal open? The sixth seal opened with this great earthquake that says in verse 12, which happened November 1st, 1755, in Lisbon, Portugal. And in this great earthquake, this great earthquake which happened in Portugal, which you might consider Europe, was felt all the way in Africa. It was felt all the way in Boston. It was recorded in newspapers. It said a chasm opened up in the city so wide it was about the size of half a football field. 
A tremendous catalyst opened up and swallowed people and livestock and houses and possessions in an instant. A great earthquake, an earthquake so great, nothing like it was seen in recorded history until our generation, Indonesia, just recently. Showing that God is still moving the prophetic scroll. But what are we doing? Wake up, Zion. Wake up, Zion. Wake up, Zion. God is about to return. And before he wakes, he wakes up a people, he must give them a message of waking. He must give them a message to wake them up that they may, through this message, purify their souls through obeying the truth, receiving his spirit, and give a witness and a truth of the world. Amen. Gathering the people of God out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people that they may be a finishing word. I'm getting ahead of myself. Look what it says in Revelation 6. It says, this great earthquake was a sign, and we know from the history of this world, any, you can Google it, November 1st, 1755, the great Lisbon earthquake. It says going on that there would be, after this earthquake, there would be a sun or the sun becoming black or going black. Not an eclipse, not the moon coming in, not a UFO, the sun just going black. The Bible also said it would happen at noon. It happened exactly at noon, as the Bible says, on May 19th, 1780. 1755, now we're at 1780. And by this, we're seeing that God is showing us the time is coming, right? The time is coming. It says here, this great earthquake will come, then the sun will come black. And on, in 1780, when this took place, at noonday, boom, the sun just went black. The cows started going back. Going back inside the barn. Right. Chickens went back and started sitting on their roosts. All the animals started coming back in. They thought it was nighttime. At noon, the sun went black. No forecast. It was, it was unexplainable. But also, the Bible said it would be black as sackcloth of hair. hair. Hmm? If you read the newspaper accounts, you can go back and look at it. It's right there. I mean, you can find some things on Google. We don't have time for all that. You can study it. 1780. If you look, the newspaper accounts said this black or this darkness that fell upon the sun was not just a, a heavenly phenomenon where just the sun went black and it was dark. They said that this darkness was palpable. It felt like cloth. You were walking through some kind of cloth like material. The Bible says like sackcloth of hair. It was palpable. It caused tremendous fear. People were going out of their mind in fear because they were in utter darkness and they could feel it pressing upon them. People were trembling for fear and for the things coming upon the earth. And this happened at noon and the earth went on and people went on and people were trembling in their homes. And that night when the sun would have eventually gone down, the moon came up as a full moon, blood red. Blood red. Blood red. And this happened showing the time of the prophecy was coming to pass. But it wasn't just the sun. It just wasn't the moon. It just wasn't the earthquake. The Bible says again, very, very carefully there. It says in verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree cast her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind on November 13th, 1833. And what does that mean? That means that we're coming down to a time where God is going to utter his voice and be able to give a message that's going to do a final work. We're coming down this time. And there were people at that time that started to hear messages and started to be strengthened. And they started to call upon the Lord to do a work and to even get ready for the second coming of God. In 1798, we know that the papacy received this deadly wound and that the, the Protestant movement was able to flourish under this wounded papacy. But, brothers and sisters, uh, less than a generation later, these prophetic signs started to unfold, showing that God was about to do his final work for his people, that the time was coming for the people of God to now ask of the Lord reign in the time of the latter reign, that God's name would be more distinctly seen in the earth in a people at this time. Amen. When we look at this in the book of Revelation chapter 6, it says very, very clearly that this would happen 
at the signs foretelling themselves or coming to pass. And immediately in verse 14, it says the heavens were departed as a scroll, meaning that you and I, since we're not living in 1780 or 1755, we're living in 2000 and what? 12. So we're living between the 13th and the 14th verse of this scripture. We're living between the 13th and 14th verse because the heaven has not opened yet. We're in a time where God needs to do this work because the next sign that we see in Revelation 6 is Jesus coming. Get ready, get ready. And as a matter of fact, as we see and jump forward in the prophecies, this vision jumps forward and Paul, John sees this, the kings of the earth and all the rich men hiding and asking for the rocks to fall upon them. The Bible asks the question in verse 17, for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? And the seventh chapter answers the question. The seventh chapter comes, which is another parallel and shows the message and the work that must be done in this time between the 13th and 14th verses of Revelation chapter 6 to finish a work. It's called the sealing work. The foundation was laid before 1844, but the sealing message would come after the year 1844 because there were some elements that had to be added to make this thing see it up, to bind up the vision and the prophecy. In the book of Revelation chapter 7, it said that this, this angel would ascend from the east. Look what it says in Revelation 7. It says, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. Amen. Which means, not only are we living between the 13th and 14th verse, but all that we see, the reason why the Hutus and the Tutsis did not come to utter extermination is because God's message hadn't finished yet. Amen. It wasn't they ran out of machetes and, 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 and the UN came in and they were... It wasn't that. God divinely intervened. Why? Because some of the greatest massacres happened at Adventist institutions. That's why. That's why you had Adventist ministers, ordained Adventist ministers, on a list of war criminals and being searched for by the war crimes tribunals. How does God's heart feel about this reality? Not just Catholic priests. Adventist compounds had tremendous massacres. Brothers and sisters, God didn't have a witness to put an end to it, so he had to intervene. This, these the, the skirmishes, nation against nation and tribe against tribe, ethnic cleansing, race against race, all this is being held in check despite the shootings, Despite the, 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 the shootings in the street that we see, despite all the evils, it's being held in check until God's message brings together his people. Brings together his people. Does this final work. And brothers and sisters, when we look at that, it says that this message or this angel is ascending with the seal of the living God. Now, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. The seal of the living God. We just talked about the early and latter rain. And we found the early and latter rain according to Moses, was the name of the Lord or the message of the work of God that showed the character of God that we receive it into the heart. But now we see the seventh chapter of Revelation brings different symbols and says, hey, no, what we're going to receive is the seal of the living God. Well, what's the seal of the living God? Let's look what it says in the book of Revelation 14. In Revelation 14, Revelation 14 in verse 1, notice what this seal of the living God, which the seventh chapter says, comes to be sealed with the 144,000 in the 14th chapter of Revelation, notice what the seal of God is. Revelation 14 and verse 1. Say amen if you have that. Amen. Oh, brothers and sisters, I, you know, I can't preach this stuff. I can't preach it. I can't preach it. It's just this message that we have, I cannot preach it. I have to ask God to help me. I can't preach. When I look at this message, I feel so inadequate to present these truths, so unworthy to present these truths. These things are as true as God lives. Amen. In Revelation chapter 14, notice what the seal of God is, which also is a, a symbol for the early and latter rain, which is the name of God, the character of God, being poured into the hearts of his people through a message 
giving justification and sanctification and perfecting them for the end time or for the last days. Look at it says in Revelation 14 and verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood upon the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having the seal of God in their forehead. Having what? Yeah. What's it say in verse 1? Yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Because the Father's name is what Moses ascribed and priest in Deuteronomy 32, which was the rain, which is the early and latter rain, which is that message that gives the character of God in their forehead or in their mind, the heart. It's all the same thing. Parallel prophecies. And brothers and sisters, this is a message for the end time because God has raised up a people to give this message at a certain time to call the people to see this truth and especially the prophecies that came up after the 1833 that showed a investigative judgment and especially those truths that showed the Sabbath and the law of God. Is there a message that has these divine signatures to them that only can perfect in character people to stand in the last days? Aren't you in Revelation 14? In Revelation 14 it says this in verse 6, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Fear God and give glory to him. What's fearing God? Write in your notes 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the... Hmm... That means that the fear of God is connected with sanctification. God is calling the world to sanctification through the first angel. He says, fear God and give glory to him. How are they going to fear God and give glory to him? Well, what's the verse 6 say? It says he's going to preach the gospel, and the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And through this message, people are going to be justified. People are going to be sanctified. And this message is going to give detailed information on how this sanctification is going to take place. It says, fear God, meaning to completely divest thyself through his power from sin. Did you get that? Yeah. Having therefore these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the, what? Spirit. How do you divest yourself from filthiness of the flesh and the spirit? Through justification. Perfecting holiness, sanctification, in the fear of God. Fear God and give, glory, give his character, and his perfected right, to him. And also it says, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. There's going to be some repentance and some reforms in this latter rain message. It's not going to not have health reform inside there. Everyone says I had the latter rain message. I don't see them teaching any health reform. Amen. I don't see them talking about medical missionary work. Amen. Hmm. I might be making some trouble here. Fear God. Give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. What message brings us to the judgment hour? 2300 days. Daniel 8, 14. Brings us right down. It had, when did it come up? It came up after 1833. Amen. But brothers and sisters, that message alone couldn't do it. You needed something else to bring this first angel into fruition because it said not only would he have this hour of his judgment, it says, worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and fountains of water. That is almost a direct transcript of Exodus chapter 20 and verse... What's it dealing with? What's it dealing with? The Sabbath. The Sabbath command says, says what? Remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day, the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy, nor thy. Because or for, this is the reason, this is the reason why you should worship him and not other idols. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Revelation? Because he is the creator. That's the first angel. This first angel's message brings us an understanding of the gospel that has never clearly been seen before. 
Paul said the judgment was still future in his time. He preached judgment to come. We're preaching judgment is here. We're preaching the time of the early and latter rain is here. But who's praying for the early and latter rain? The people that are praying for the early and latter rain don't understand the work of preparation to receive it. They're kneeling down praying for the early and latter rain. You know, I can't stand you. Mm. Oh, I hope he don't preach again. Oh, my goodness. Uh, who does she think she is? I'm sure. Yeah. Praying for the early night of rain. If the early night of rain fell upon that, what would it do to it? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, praying for the early night of rain as a gimmick, but do not understand the work of preparation to prepare that flesh to receive the Spirit of God, to sanctify this flesh. Because the Bible says we must purify, purify the flesh and the spirit. spirit so that all flesh like that can receive the outpouring of the Spirit. How does it happen? Through a correct understanding of the message. Where's that message found? It's found in Revelation 7. It's found all over, especially found more clearly, according to the great controversy, in Revelation 14, verse 6 through 12. More clearly shown to us in Revelation 14, verse 6 through 12. This message, even the third angel, is righteous by faith, or this message of the latter rain, in verity. But brothers and sisters, here's the problem. Here's the problem. When's the last time you heard this in the churches of our land? This message that was to prepare a people. Do you know that when we look at this shooting where people were watching Batman, the pastor said, I wonder how many Adventists were inside there watching Batman. You know why that shooting took place? Because we're unfaithful. We should have been home a long time ago. You know why this war took place over here in Afghanistan and all this? You know why all this stuff is happening? Because of us. God is holding back the winds of strife and the Spirit of Prophet says, little gusts are being let go and God is holding. Little gusts here and there. World War I, World War II, Gulf War. All these things are happening, but God is trying to hold back the winds of strife that this work, but he won't hold it forever. Because while he's holding, he is gathering, he is developing, he is bringing together a people. Oh, brothers and sisters, here we get, we're getting to the good part now. Now, when we look at Revelation chapter 14, we're seeing that God has given us a clear understanding of the message for this time. And we know that we're preaching the right message, but brothers and sisters, no one is preaching it. Who's preaching this? Who's preaching health reform in connection with the gospel, in connection with victory over sin in the first angel, in connection with the 2300 days, and the faith of Jesus, and the commandments of God, to show our past history, and the glorious future? Who's taking them into what Babylon is, and its fall, and avoiding the wine? Who's taking them to show what the beast and the mark is and also what this wrath of God is and how to avoid the image of the beast? Who's doing that? And if this is not happening, then God is somewhere, somehow, gathering a people called in verse 12 saints that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And what God's going to do because this rain is pouring on them, this message is pouring on them, this character is being developed in them, as a result of the preaching of the three in this message, God says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep in their lives the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and they, because they are grass, because they are agriculturally symbolic, they are being ripened for the harvest. That's why in the book of Revelation chapter 14 and verse 14 it says this. In Revelation 14 and 14 it says, And I looked and lo, or behold, a white cloud. And upon the clouds one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat upon the cloud, saying, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come. Time for the latter rain, and a time to reap. A time is come to reap, for the harvest is the, of the earth is what has ripened the earth. Remember the earth, the rain fell on the earth. The rain fell upon the earth, literally, and also fell upon the heart. What has caused this harvest to spring up and to ripen for harvesting? What has developed the harvest? The latter rain, which is the three angels' 
message. But what if we're not hearing this in our churches? What if we're not being sealed but seared? What if we're not hearing the, 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 the message of sanctification but the message of celebration? What if we're not hearing about the NSL but sitting on the NLP? You don't know about that. You don't know about that. What, what, what if? What happens? The Bible says clearly that there are two harvests though. One is the wheat and God sickles that off and gathers it onto himself. But when God is finished harvesting, separating the wheat from the tares through the three angels message, also the third angel, when he separated this, this group that we are so confused over, and he's gathered his people and he harvests them, then a second harvest happens. You ever heard of the book, The Grapes of Wrath? That's not, man, that's, people, say, people often say, wow, that's a wonderful title. That's plagiarism. The grapes of wrath are in Revelation 14. Because whatever is left over are the grapes of wrath. And upon the authority of God's word and the message of the book Great Controversy, many former or one time, or even now presently, but future, one time, seven day Adventists, we will be among that number called the grapes of wrath. Not harvested and gathered unto Christ, but the Bible says here in the verse 17, it says, and another angel came out of the temple. Verse four, chapter 14, verse 17, and another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice, or a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, another guy, another sickle, saying, thrust in thy sharp sickle, and what? and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. The rejection of the three in his message, while some are receiving it, the receiving of the latter rain message and the power on one, and the rejection and the casting off, and the saying you're a fanatic and kicking you out of the church of the other, is causing these people to also be fully ripe in apostasy. And this, the Bible says, in verse 19, it's calling the angel to thrust in his sickle to the earth and gather the vine of the earth and cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Right in your notes, Revelation 15 and verse 1. In Revelation 15 and verse 1, it says that the seven last plagues fills up the wrath of God. So in other words, those that are not hearing this in their church or those that are hearing people preach it, and they said, what? I don't need to do all that. I'm already baptized. They didn't tell me that when I was baptized. Do you think you know more than the pastor? No, I, yes or no, do you know more than the pastor? Yes or no, do you know more than the pastor? Do you, do you know more than, yes or no, do you know more than the general conference? You ever had that conversation? Boom. Don't want to hear it. There are many that will see and hear the truth and will accept it, but some do not want to hear the message. And we need to go forward and gather the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. Now, people say, oh, the lost sheep. Oh, yeah, you're talking about in-reach. No, I'm not into in-reach. We're, we're to reach in as we're reaching out. Because the Bible clearly said, well, you know what? The spirit of prophecy, let's get the spirit of prophecy for a moment here. We're getting a lot of Bible. The spirit of prophecy says in Desire of Ages that the true interpreting of the lost, house, lost sheep of the house of Israel includes those nations surrounding Israel that because of the apostasy were never touched. She says that that woman at the well should have been reached because she was so near to Israel, but she was not because of prejudice and spiritual pride. She was among the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That Syrophoenician woman, that Canaanite woman, all these individuals that Christ met and talked with, they should have been reached with the gospel because they were given, Israel of old was given the message to take all the world like Seventh-day Adventists today. And Seventh-day Adventists today, like of old, have canceled their missionary societies. They have gotten rid of all the Bible workers. In many conferences, the advantage position has been taken away. They very, very rarely even bring, they're putting away and laying off more passes than they're bringing out. And those that are being brought out have been given a questionable doctrine. I didn't say questions on doctrine. I say questionable doctrine to preach in the church. Some people understand what I'm talking about. And because of this, there's a direct parallel, brothers and sisters, a direct parallel. And it's going to cause many sitting and hearing nothing, sitting and hearing smooth things to be among the grapes of wrath. 
But God is gathering his people. God is raising up a people for these last days. And this message is showing us, let's close, okay? You say, what? Yeah, let's close. Let's go, because we looked at Joel chapter 2 and looked at the last part, and we looked at the middle. Let's go to the beginning of Joel and see what work prepared the people in the time of Joel, prepared the disciples in the time of Jesus, and in parallel nature will prepare the people in the last days to receive the three angels' message only if they want to. Brother says, he's not going to force you. He's not going to force you. He's not going to force you. He's not going to force you to get up and have morning devotion. He's not going to force you to be good to your wife. He's not going to force you to do what's right. He's not going to force you to do it. He may cause trials and tribulations to come upon you, to cause you to think and, and to come to God, but he's not going to force you. He can't force you. When we look at Joel 2, there was a work preparatory, a work necessary to prepare that all flesh, a work that was necessary that God could say, be glad then at this time because of this work, ye children of Zion. And matter of let's look at that. Joel 2, we're closing now. I told you I wasn't going to rush through this. Joel 2, Joel 2, do you have that? I know you're tired, you're hungry, you haven't eaten all hour. <laughs> you used to getting out at 12.01 at church. Oh, and don't be in a West Indian church. As soon as the clock hit 12, you had strips. <sighs> Only West Indians know what I'm talking about. That sign, the sucking of the teeth, is synonymous in West Indian culture of severe displeasure. <laughs> severe displeasure. A West Indian suck his teeth, apologize profusely. Because this is a cultural norm that should have been dealt with through divine grace. And there should be a love for God's word. If the spirit is moving, Let's let it roll. Amen. Now, if you're going somewhere and the person does not have the spirit and doesn't have the truth, then does he have the problem with you? He's preaching what he thinks is his message. What are you doing there? Joel 2 says this. Joel 2. How shall we awaken Zion? Let's close with this thought. Because Joel not only shows the latter rain and how we'll be glad then, which is now. Ever since 1850-something, God has been with the Sabbath truth, 1847 and so on, God has been with the Sabbath truth, been giving a clear message to bring people to Christian perfection. It's been growing a little brighter and brighter and brighter, and God has given it as a complete message, but now it seems like, is God's message the Trinity? Is God's message that God's name is Jehovah or Yahweh or Yeshua? Or, or, is, God, is God's message that um, you know, Jesus didn't wear underwear, so I shouldn't either. It's God's message that, you know, I have to wear a beard. Or, I mean, uh, all these things that, what have these things to do with sanctification? The mind is so easily diverted. So easily diverted, brothers and sisters. We need to be on one accord in one place. And the only way is Zion needs to be awakened. And there's a way that God's going to awaken Zion because the reason why we don't see a greater revival is because what we see in Joel chapter 2 verse 1 all the way to verse 20 is not taking place to a good degree. But everywhere it does, we'll see Zion away. And what is Zion? Let's look at Joel 2. In Joel 2 it says, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the earth or the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. That's a powerful text. That text gives very, very great ages to preaching with emphasis. Yes. Have you ever heard someone sound an alarm like this? Well, you know, in the Bible, it teaches that the scriptures, well, you know, funny thing happened when we were in Jerusalem the other day. Um, do you see people teach like that now? So casual. They talk about God like he's a pair of shoes. They talk about God as if he's a pair of socks. Oh, do I want this one or do I want that one? Hmm. Um. Is God holy? Is there some reverence to preaching God's word? 
Is it a time of urgency and alarm? And why are you preaching it like you're selling socks at Macy's? Well, these socks are good, but these are wool socks. And, you know, they're very warm. And some, you know, I, I had an aunt that just loved wool socks, and she once needed me. A, people preach like this. They preach like this. They preach as if they don't really believe that what they're presenting is urgent. So even if the message might be doctrinally true, yes. experientially or in the context of how you're hearing it, yes. you are conditioned to think that this is a fairy tale just like Snow White, just like Aesop's Fable, all that stuff. Because my mom, my grandmother used to tell stories with such emotion. She'd make these characters, and you'd be under there with the covers, and you'd be... Ah, and what happened next? And what happened next? And what happened next? And you'd be so convicted. But when she was finished, whoo, that was good. Anything to drink? You know it was a story. You know it wasn't true. And we come, and the church is now spiritual entertainment. People say, oh, we don't want any pantomiming and plays in the church. But and sisters, what happened in the pulpit is a play. It's not real. It's not real. And the people discern this, but it's a pleasant lie. It's a pleasant lie because smooth things don't prick the heart and cause you to feel that you aren't okay. I'm okay, you're okay. Ever heard of that? It's called psychology. How many ministers have a minor in psychology? That's, that's for ministers that listen to this, not you. That, it's, it's for other people. In Joel 2, it says, blow the trumpet in Zion. It says the alarm. But what is this blowing of the trumpet? The blowing of the trumpet is another parallel prophecy which Ellen White also says with Revelation 7 and Acts chapter 2 and Revelation 14 is the message for this time. What's blowing the trumpet? Isaiah 58 says what? I, you don't know Isaiah 58? Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy tr voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of my what? Brothers and sisters, this trumpet blown is the message, a message of repentance to God's people. And trumpets were blown to awaken people to upcoming danger or upcoming prophetic events or meetings of spiritual import. And whether either one you choose, we are to blow the trumpet in Zion and connected with this is showing the people their sins. But you can't be popular doing that. So if you want to be popular... You blow the harmonica in Zion. You blow your nose in Zion. You blow the only chance the world has to be saved in Zion, but not the trumpet. You won't give the message. And in Isaiah 58, we see medical missionary work combined with the gospel. We see practical work for the soul, for the indigent, for the poor, for the sick, combined with spirituality. And God said, if you do this, then you'll call and I'll say, here I am. God will be before us. He'll give us his spirit. He'll give us the heritage of Jacob. What's that? But it says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Now, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Where to blow the trumpet in Zion. Where to wake up the church. Wake up the church through this message, which is a parallel of Isaiah 14, Revelation 14, and all the various things that we looked at. This message wakes up the church. So the antithesis is, without this message, the church is, this message brings an alarm and urgency and prepares for the coming of the Lord, showing us at hand. The reverse is, the other one puts it to sleep, puts Jesus coming far in the future, and instead of occupying till he comes, we're dancing like David till he comes. We're, we're doing everything else. We're having block parties on Sabbath. Roasting chicken and beef and sausages. What's sausage? To win souls. We're turning to the book of Isaiah. What's Zion? What is Zion? Blow the trumpet in Zion. We didn't need to pick a point here. I'm almost done. I told you I won't be too long, but I won't stop. Early. In the book of Isaiah 51, Isaiah, what chapter are we looking for? 51. Isaiah 51. Blow the trumpet where? In Zion. In Zion. And Isaiah 51 says this. 
Isaiah 51 and verse 16. Isaiah 51 and verse 16, because it says, blow the trumpet in Zion. And we have to understand that blowing the trumpet in Zion is a work that prepares the people to receive the early and latter rain. Because what we're going to see in all these verses, all this work causes God to say, be glad then, therefore. Based upon this work being done, you can be glad because you're going to receive through this preparation, this occupying the early, the latter rain, and God will do all in his pointed time. And Isaiah 51, let's see where this Zion is. Zion says this. It says, Isaiah 51 and verse 16, it says what? And I put my words in thy, like Moses said, right? And I covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, and I may plant the heavens, and lay the foundation of the earth, and say to Zion, thou art my, thou art what? So when we're talking about blow the trumpet in Zion, where are we blowing this trumpet? Wherever God's people are. It didn't say blow the trumpet in a building. It said blow the trumpet in Zion, which means among God's people. Let the people hear the message. Anything that's restricting this message from going forth is, a, is an affront to the message of Revelation 14. It's an affront to gospel order. It's an affront to the basic principles of Protestantism and Christianity because this message is to be blown in and among God's people and who dares restrict it? Who dares restrict that which will save the soul and perfect character and prepare people for the time of trouble before they have no shelter? Who restrict this? It says, blow the trumpet in Zion and Zion is who? God's people. God in uh, Joel 2 even makes it clear who he's talking about. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in all my, in all my holy mountain. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound that alarm in my, Zion is the holy mountain. Zion is the, people say, no, Zion not the holy mountain. It's two different things. Zion is God's people, and the holy mountain is explained very clearly in Daniel chapter 9. Look at Daniel 9 now. I know there's too many scriptures for you, but you know, we, just for the sake of, you know, camp meeting once a year, let's look at some scriptures today. In the book of Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, are we in Daniel chapter 9? Look at Daniel chapter 9, and I want you to drop your eyes down to verse 16. Now, brothers and sisters, you know very well I could preach this and preach some of the, many of these things from my memory, but I'm not here to try and impress you and puff up myself in pride. Quote, I mean, I'm not here to quote scripture. I want us to walk together and behold and read and hear these things that we may keep them. We can write them down. We can experience this message, okay? We're almost finished. Almost finished. In the book of Daniel chapter 9, notice how just as we found that Zion is God's people, Daniel explains what the holy mountain is. This is very important. Very important. And Daniel 9 says this. Daniel 9 and verse 16. Say amen if you have it. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from what? Thy city Jerusalem, comma, what? Thy holy mountain. So Jerusalem is the... We're continuing on, continuing on. Because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are. The holy mountain is Jerusalem, which is God's. See, you see a triple application there. In one text, triple application. The holy mountain is Jerusalem, which com is comprised or is God's. You say, are you sure? Look at Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9 and Verse 20. In Daniel 9 and verse 20 it says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin, and the sin of who? The sin of my people, Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the... So the holy mountain of God is Israel, which is God's people, which is also Jerusalem. So Jerusalem, or the holy mountain, or the Zion, all is really meaning what? God's people. Now, when we hear the word Zion or we hear the word Jerusalem, what do we think of? The church at the top, the corporate structure, the conferences and so on, right? Don't we think about that? That's what people say. I've heard people say that, you know what? When we look at the prophecies, you ha if you want to be sealed, you have to be 
under the general conference, you need to be endorsed by the general conference. The conference has to endorse you and put their approval upon you. You know, if you get kicked out of the church for preaching the truth, you're lost. You're, you're in purgatory. You're not in heaven or in hell. You're in purgatory. You're in limbo. But the Bible says that Jerusalem is God's people. And we just found out that this message of the early night of rain, the sealing message, would take place after 1833, when this message bringing the judgment, which is the 23 days, ended in 1844. After 1844, now we can say, this message is going to come that also we saw it bring the Sabbath, so it brings it down to 1847, 1850. Here we see a message being brought to view, rising out of the east symbolically, rising as the sunrise, bright and brighter to its apex, that comes and seals the people in their forehead. Now, if this message of Revelation 14 is the sealing message, and we've seen the time that this sealing work would begin happen all the way back in the 1840s. Testimonies Volume 1 says the sealing work had begun. It was dated 1850-something. The sealing work began in the 1850s, 18, late 1840s, 50s. This is the time the sealing work began from prophecy and from the Testimonies Volume 1. If that is true, then when did Ezekiel 9 begin? Too much deep theology now. Because Ezekiel 9 is the sealing, right? And the horn angel was going to seal the people of God. And Ellen White said people were sealed in her day. Did she not in the testimonies? You've read the testimonies, haven't you? You've read the testimonies, haven't you? You've read the testimonies, haven't you? And that's, not, that's not to make you say it. That's to, to emphasize the fact that, hey, hmm, I haven't read the testimonies. Wow. Brothers and sisters, God started seeing his people long ago. And when you look at Ezekiel 9, go back and study it. Ezekiel 9 says the sin would take place in, starts with the J, Jerusalem. In where? And we said Jerusalem is the conference. Jerusalem is God's people. He said, no, 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 no. It sounded good, but now I can't accept that. You can't accept it because you can't accept this word. But even look at history, brothers and sisters. Look at history. Because when God started this movement in 1844 and so on, 1843, when they started coming together with the Sabbath conferences, were there any conferences? There were no conferences. When the sealing work began and the Sabbath came in and all these truths started to link point to point to point and this message went forward with power, there were no conferences until 1863. So you mean that God started sealing his people in Jerusalem almost 10 years before there was ever a conference? Which means that Jerusalem can never be the conference because there was no conference when God started seeing his people in Jerusalem. You didn't get that. But we're going to Daniel 9 again. I'm oh, sorry, Joel 2. Get the tape and look at that. Get the tape and look back at that. In Joel 2 it says this, as we close. In Joel 2, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound along on my holy mountain, let the inhabitants of the land tremble, not just, you know, have a good time, but let their heart be moved by the preaching of God's word. For the day of God is at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds of thick darkness, spread upon the mountains. All these texts from verse 3 and 4 and 5, all the way down, it shows the time, it shows the events, it shows what type of coming of the Lord it is, the second coming. It shows the signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And then, as you come over to verse 12, now God picks back up this work of preparation of blowing the trumpet and giving this message to show what's preparation for the latter rain. It says in verse 12 this, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your, all your tithe and offering. Make sure it's turned in. If God has the heart, he has the tithe and offering. Turn ye to me with even with all your heart. This, work, this message is the heart work. So what's God asking for with this blowing the trumpet? Just outward conformity? Is God asking for outward conformity to bring on the early night of rain? It's a work that must happen and begin in the heart. It's a work of justification and sanctification. This is our great need. If we can have this, all the other things will become easy to us. Oh, this, I can't understand what this brother is talking about sometimes. The Spirit will teach you all things. Turn to me with all your heart, it says, with fasting and with weeping and with Morning. Now, verse 12 shows that this work we see is also a parallel of Malachi chapter 4. I couldn't get any amen for that. 
Why is this a parallel of Malachi chapter 4? Because Malachi 4 says Elijah will come in the last days, and what will Elijah do to the father and the sons? Turn the hearts. So this message of Joel and of Isaiah 58 and Revelation 14 also is parallel with the message of Elijah, Malachi 4. The turning of the heart is here in Joel 2. It says going on, verse 13, not only did it have fasting and mourning, which is the atonement, but we're going to verse 13. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is, here's the character, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, great kindness, repenteth him of, where did we see that before? What, oh, you weren't here? Where did we see that before? We saw that with Moses, which called him to have that new heart, is the same experience that Moses had, and I, you remember that? Isaiah had, that we talked about we need in these last days that caused all the earth to be filled with the glory of God, it's right here in Joel 2. This is the work that's preparing a people. This is the message that's preparing a people so that a Zion will be awakened and the early and latter rain can be filled into prepared vessels. And if this is not going on in your church, in my church, well, Lord have mercy. What shall happen to Zion? Verse 14 says, Who knoweth if God, verse 14, will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering, Unto the Lord your God. What offering do we need to give now according to Romans 12 and verse 1? Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, by the latter rain message and latter rain power, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What's the will of God? Even your sanctification. It says this. Blow the trumpet. Verse 15. He says it again. Why does God repeat things? Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a brother and sister. Sancti he says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Can we eat what we want? Ministers coming and taking a box of Kentucky Fried Chicken, put it in the pulpit. You ever heard that one? A box of Kentucky Fried Chicken. I know all you Pharisees out there. <sighs> On Sabbath. What's going to wake up Zion? What's going to prepare people? Blowing the trumpet, showing the people their sins, hearing, letting the people of God hear the message. He says, blow it. He says again, blow the trumpet, but I want you to blow it in a sanctified, a solemn assembly with fasting. What fasting? The day of atonement was a fast day. It says this meeting should be a solemn assembly. In other words, you cannot preach. I don't care how good you think you're preaching the message. If you're doing it in celebration, you're out of position. A solemn assembly is the place for the pouring of the early and latter rain because the Bible said, sorry, the Spirit of Prophecy says that the Holy Spirit never revealed himself in such methods. The Holy Spirit will never be poured out with such methods. It's not a black thing, or a Jewish thing, or a Brazilian thing. It's a Satan thing. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation, ministers. Don't sleep with them. Don't bring the Super Bowl parties in the church. Popcorn everywhere in the church. Jelly beans all in the church. Vacuum of jelly beans and ketchup stains in, in the church pews. It's like a Super Bowl party. Come on. Sanctify a fast, it says. Sanctify the people. Assemble the elders. This message is going to gather the elders together. It's gather the people together. This is what happened in the upper room, brothers and sisters. When Jesus met with them, he gathered them together. His message gathered them together. What message? He started with Moses and all the prophets and showed all things concerning himself. His gospel that gathered them was connected with the prophecies of Christ. This gathered the people and caused them to go into the upper room. Gather the elders. Gather the children, a final generation. Those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. We're closing here, verse 17. Let the priests... The minister of the Lord, let those that are preaching in the pulpit, let Seventh-day Adventist ministers yes. weep between the porch and the altar. altar. What was between the porch and the altar? 
What took, what took place between the porch and the altar? The minister would meet the sinner there with his offering. The minister would take that lamb and slay the lamb to put it upon the altar, between the porch and the altar. This would take place there. They would be weeping. They would be not celebrating, but they would be weeping. There would be strong emotion. There would be earnest, plead with the sinners to come to Christ. Now, at that time, this is the work of seven-day minister, and it says, going on, it says, saying, or saying to them, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. But brothers and sisters, the heathen are ruling over us today. The heathen are ruling over us. The heathen rule over, no, the heathen are ruling over us. Look at the fashion you see in the church. People tipsying in with parasols and, and skin tight, a, a split up here, a split back here, a split this side, a split this side, split up the side. Even the coat they have has a split up. Everything is split. Are the heathens ruling or having authority in the church? The heathens are ruling over us. There's no weeping between the porch and altar. There's no saying, Lord, spare thy people. Give them a little bit more time to hear this message that I may blow the trumpet and gather the people together, gather the church. John 17, unity is seen in Joel 2 because this message and spirit gathers the people together in fellowship. The ministers are saying, spare thy people, O Lord, let not the heathen rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Where is God? Atheism is run amok in this generation. Why? Brothers and sisters, is it time to wake up? Is it time for asking of the rain, the time of the latter rain? Do we need it? Is your life ready to receive the outpouring of the Spirit of God? Are you understanding it's not just the pouring out of just the Spirit, it's the message that makes preparation, the message that warns and shows our sins that we may be healed and made right and justified by the truth and that we can be sanctified through the truth that God can finish a work in us. Without this, there'll be no finish of the work. Why would God give the latter rain if you haven't received or have made preparation for the early rain, if you haven't been justified in walking in the truth and understanding the message from point to point and line to line, what is the latter rain power going to do for you? Is it going to give you greater power to watch HBO? Greater power to watch the Olympics? Greater power to sit and watch people go idly by and not attract or speak to Christ or how you doing or praise God or Jesus? Nothing. Is it going to give you more power to do that? He that winneth souls is wise. He that winneth souls is going to enter in with the bridegroom. He that winneth souls is going to receive this endowment. Those that are doing the work, those that are sincerely loving God and making preparation will be filled in these last days. Brothers and sisters, I want it to be me. How about you? I need the Spirit of God. Brothers and sisters, I believe that every person inside here can receive the Spirit of God. Young men, old men, women, girls. But the problem is, our hearts are hardened. Right now, Individuals feel no need for the truth and the experience I'm talking about right now. They feel no need. And guess what? God understands that you have no desire for this. He knows that. But he says, I will help you. I will help you. Ask of the Lord. Rain in the time of the latter rain. God will pour out blessings upon us. God will revive the heart. Right now, are you ready to die? Let's, let's leave this idea of sanctification and so on alone. Are you ready to die today? Are you ready to die? Are you ready to die? For instance, are you ready to die? In Columbine, they had testimony of these different individuals that were eyewitnesses and so on and so forth. They were in the lunchroom when these people came in with the gun and so on. And they started going around and shooting and shooting and shooting. And one guy came up to this girl and the, everyone knew she was a Christian. Do you remember that story? Oh, yeah. You remember that story? Oh, yeah. And he came up to her and he put the gun right in her face and said, are you ready to die? Are you ready to die? She said yes. Pow! Are you ready to die? If you're not ready to die, you'll never live. Anything you can accomplish in this world will be nothing. When I was 19 years old, 
I received a piece of paper in my office as I was in the military serving in Japan. A piece of paper said, you have been chosen to be interviewed for the White House Communications Agency. They wanted to give me a White House assignment when I was in the military. But guess what? I was reading Daniel Revelation by Uriah Smith. I was reading Adventist Home. I was reading Cows and Dyes and Food. I was reading these various books. And I wasn't converted, but I was deeply convicted that I was a sinner and I needed Christ. And I didn't know really how to be converted, but I knew that this message was true. And the great burden of conviction that rested upon me, I had a burden similar to the, 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 the hero in, in Paul Bunyan's allegory, where he said he had this tremendous burden on his back. And he asked a friend, he said, do you have a burden? He said, no, I don't have any burden. I'm here in the work. I'm going. Work. Hey, let's come on. Run fast. Let's go to Celestial City. Wait, I can't keep up with you. I have this burden. Oh, I don't have any burden. I don't. I feel. Let's 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 do more, then. Let's do more. No burden. God had put a burden because God had changed the heart. We need a burden for the work, brothers and sisters. We need that burden to be placed upon us. And I did not have an understanding how to be changed, but this burden came upon me, and I started seeing that. Hey. The Berlin Wall fell while I was in the military. Communism fell when I was in the military. We went into the Middle East while I was in the military. We started going to all these various things, countries. Communists started to, to fail. All these things, like Star Wars, all this stuff happened while I was in the military. First Desert Storm, all that stuff happened. I read it in Daniel and Revelation. My eyes used to be big yeah. reading these things. And I would say, I would read something, and I would say, you know what? I was 19, 19 years old. I went to Japan when I was 17. My mother signed for me to go in the military because I was too young. She signed for me. I got to Japan, I was 17. I turned 18 in Japan. And I was in my dorm room reading this thing, and I would read, and I would get so convicted. I'd get so convicted reading that stuff. So convicted. And I somehow would be there, and tears would come in my eyes because I saw that I was a sinner. It was talking about sin, and these are sins I was committing. I said, how can I meet God like this? It talked about the coming of Christ and how powerful it would be and how he's giving us an opportunity to make it right now. And I would read about that and I knew I wasn't ready and tears would well up in my eyes and I didn't know how to talk to God and I would say, God, just help me. I don't know. Just, God, help me. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know all this Heavenly Father, stuff like that. I learned that. All I could say was, God, help me. Help me. I don't know, and I'd read some more, and I'd get convicted, and something would strike something that I was really wanting to hold on to, and I would, I would close the book, and I'd say, no, 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 no. I'd walk away from it. I'd say, no, 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 no. I'd walk away, and I'd walk away, and I'd walk away, and walk away, walk away, and I'd try and move away from it, but that, that, that book that kept on calling me. Satan has power in his books, and God has power in his books. There was angels in those rooms. I would go back to that dorm room, and I'd have to open the book again, and I'd open the book, and I'd go right to the same spot, and as soon as I said the same spot, that conviction came upon me again. And I was there in Nero's uh, judgment hall. I was there in the Colosseum. I was there in Daniel's uh, uh, chamber as he prayed. I was there watching, seeing all that happened. But I was crying out to God for a deeper experience. I didn't know how to give my heart to God. But this conviction came upon me. I wish I had someone to tell me about justification and sanctification. Like you've had opportunity here. And there are many that, like me, were practicing spiritualism, teaching it in various places, in sin, that are wistfully looking their eyes to heaven and asking for God to send them someone to teach them the truth. They are searching for truth and longing for guidance. And God is able to give them power. But brothers and sisters, it seems like among us, or even us, we have no heart or soul hunger for God. We feel that we can pray. Some people can't even pray. They don't know how to pray. And they're looking to God and say, God, I don't know how to talk to you. I, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I, I, I'm reading this book and I, I, I want to be saved. But could you help me, please? I just don't know how. Please, please have mercy on me. I'm sorry. I didn't know there was a Sabbath. I'm sorry. Just give me a chance, Lord. Let me help, help me understand this book. And I, started, I would read and I would read. And I thought by reading, I would be saved. By reading, the more knowledge. And I would read and I would pray and I would fall asleep. And I'd wake up and I'd read more, and I would go back in the sink. I had no power. And I would say, well, yeah, I, I did wrong, but let me, let me go and read some more. Read some more. But you know what? As I immersed myself in the things of God, God brought me to justification. Amen. God revealed himself to me. God saved me. 
from the occult, from spiritualism. God saved me from the, the imaginations of my mind. God saved me from sin. And he could do it for you. He could do it for you. He could do it for you today. We can be justified and sanctified through Jesus Christ. We can receive the early and latter rain. God is the same God that was there with me in that dorm room in Japan when I was just a teenager. He's never failed me. He's never failed me. And he loves you. He loves you. He wants you to give your heart. Can't you give your heart to God? What has God ever done to you? Can't you give your heart to God? Don't you want to give your heart to God? Don't you want to give your heart to God? Jesus upon that cross said, I thirst! I thirst! I thirst! And they ran and gave him poison and pushed it in his mouth. Ellen White said that he had physical thirst, but in a greater sense, he was thirsting for you and I to drink with him of the well of salvation. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And even if you say, oh, I know the truth, that's not pray that, that prayer is for you. Because really, if you understood what you were doing, it would horrify you. When we see in panoramic display our sins, we're going to be horrified. We're going to be horrified for a moment, but the character's not going to be changed. Brothers and sisters, Jesus died upon the cross for you. When he said, it is done, he has given you a pledge that he has done the work to bring you to justification. And he's going to continue the work even now that he can sanctify you wholly. Don't you want to give Jesus your hand today? Don't you want to give, give Jesus your hand today? Don't you want to love Jesus? If you want to love Jesus, if you want to be a seven-day Adventist, a Christian, a believer, a follower, a disciple, why don't you stand and pray with me? Why don't you stand and pray with me? Anyone want to give Jesus their hand today? Anyone want to love Jesus? Anyone want to be with Jesus? Anyone want to give Jesus their heart? Anyone know what it is to give Christ your heart? Oh, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. What a Savior. Lay not this sin. You know when he said that? His lip was burst. Someone punched him in his mouth. And with a swollen lip, he said, lay not this sin to their charge. He had blood coming out of the side of his face where they ripped hair and probably skin out. They had the sin to their charge. Crown of thorns pressing down into his flesh and through his flesh like piercings down to his eyebrows, causing blood to trickle down and sweat, burning his eyes, blood in his eyes, blood in his nose, bloody nose. Lay not the sin to their charge. Forgive them, Lord. Forgive them. Those words encompass all of us. Can we give God our heart? Can we pray together? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, upon the authority of God's word, strengthen us, give us, pour out to us thy spirit. You have brought our hearts to a deeper, fuller understanding of thy holy law and requirements. And Lord, I thank you for revealing thyself to me. Lord, help me to be faithful. I've been so unfaithful, dear God. I've been so unfaithful. But you've shown me plenty of mercy. You've put me in a position where I have to study to give messages. You've put me in a situation where it's, it's easier for me to be saved because it's so easy, you know, for me to be lost. Thank you, dear God, for putting me in the ministry. Thank you, dear God, for giving me an opportunity to teach people the truth because I've taught so many people iniquity. I can never undo the damage I've done to people and to your kingdom. But Lord, in Jesus, I have plenty of redemption and forgiveness of sins. Yes. I want my brothers and sisters to experience it today, to abide in it today, to reacquaint themselves with this living power today. Say to the left and to the right, dear God, break shackles, destroy the power of addictions in this room today yes. under the authority of the Holy Spirit. Give husbands a love for their wives again. And why the love for their husbands? Give children respect to their parents, a desire to do the will of God. Sanctify us. Gather us together through thy power. Lord, let it be finished, not upon the cross, but in me. For we ask, pray, and believe all these things. Let's say it together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Please be seated for a moment of silent meditation.